Welcome to the second part of the second session. And it consists of three invited talks. Uh, the first one will be delivered by Claudia De Vitis. And the title is uh, Smart Surveys, Methodological Issues and Challenges for Official Statistics. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, okay, I can wait just. Uh, okay, M my presentation uh, is uh, inten in is intended to to offer an overview, an overview of uh, about the smart service, about in particular the methodological issues and challenges for the official statistics, together with uh, a, a short. Uh, a report on uh, the involvement of uh, ISTAT in uh, the European project uh, regarding this, uh, this topic. So, um, what are smart surveys? Uh, smart surveys are, first of all, surveys that are carried out using uh, uh, respondent smart devices. So, are uh, app-based mobile survey, which combines data for, from a web questionnaire with the sensor data. Sensor data is uh, the word to, to be stressed. So the smart service can be designed for any device, a personal device, that has access to passive data collection capabilities through one or more sensors and provide access to their sensor data to other applications. So, uh, what the respondent uh, does is to install an app on his uh, device, his smartphone in general, and use this app to uh, um, respond to the survey. So, the combination of sensor and app data uh, represents an hybrid form of uh, data collection. And so, uh, for example, in official social surveys, uh, we um, we consider data from diaries, in particular, and sensors together. For example, for the House of Budget Survey, uh, HBS, and the Time Use Survey. So, smart surveys are a traditional source of non-traditional data. Traditional source because it is a survey with a sample, with a sample uh, uh, selected from a target population, representative sample but using uh, also non-traditional data. In this type of survey, the, uh, a central role uh, is the role of the respondent, which uh, uh, interact continuously and uh, at low intensity with the, uh, the personal device. Smart service become a trusted smart survey when there is involvement on, of uh, third parties citizen, private companies, public body, with whom the uh, National Statistical Institute establish a relation of trust. Uh, particular uh, attention is given to, the, uh, to gaining the respondent trust through consent, engagement, and use of privacy enhancing technologies to protect uh, personal data. So, smart surveys for official statistics. Um, have uh, many potentialities, but also several issues. The potentialities uh, are that uh, we can obtain from the respondent uh, infor useful information with less disturbance, so less burden, and also greater accuracy. Uh, the measurement capabilities of mobile devices can supplement or also or even replace self-reports uh, in surveys providing high frequency and uh, very detailed data. Uh, used in combination with the traditional data, uh, smart surveys can contribute to, to no response reduction in social survey. We know that it is a big issue for official statistics, uh, the reduction of uh, response rates in social surveys. And uh, uh, using these new types, this new type of data collection, can, uh, can provide uh, um, a help. But uh, we have several issues and I would say challenges. Uh, the issue of consent of the respondent to provide uh, 
uh, sensor data and uh, being involved uh, as an active subject. Coverage problems because uh, smart surveys uh, re reach only a part of uh, a population. For the uh, National Statistical Institute uh, is uh, a general challenge not, not only for methodological issues but also for architectural and technological uh, uh, issue that needs that uh, um, needs to um, their design all the process of the, the survey. Then there is also the, uh, of course, the issue of preserving privacy when data are transmitted, stored, and processed. New methods are needed to transform raw data to statistical information, and then. Last but not least, uh, we have a big impact on the quality of the, of the data. We will see. Here, it just is a very short, very quick focus on uh, the type of sensor data that are used in smart surveys. Um, it, we, we, I have to stress the fact that it's very important to identify the sensor data that can provide the most accurate measurement of the construct to be investigated. Um, the type of sensor data used for social surveys can be images uh, from camera to take photo, for example, receipt in the household budget survey. Location data from the GPS used in time use survey and mobility surveys. Acceleration by, from accelerometer or gyroscope or also external sensor, for example, for living condition measuring air quality. So sensors can offer objective data that can replace subjective answers provided by, by a questionnaire, so providing a proxy for the statistical variable and can also reduce human, uh, human error by shifting the potential bias in response to a technology-based error. It's not the focus of this presentation, but of course, ethical and legal aspects are very important. And uh, the legal basis is the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation in Europe. Um, it is important to, to have an agreement between the parties and in general, uh, we refer to a privacy by design approach. Coming to the methodological uh, aspect, we have several uh, challenges. Uh, in fact, the literature on sensor data, uh, sensor data processing is very wide and mainly technolo technology oriented, but uh, uh, less uh, wide for, uh, in, for the survey context, especially for official statistics. We have several challenges deriving from the participant selectivity, the non-willingness to provide sensor or to participate, and the quality of the data. So crucial method methodological aspects are uh, regards the data collection strategies, data processing, and the quality of uh, the data. We will see some detail. Regarding data collection issues uh, here, I put only uh, some example of the strategies of, and, and the issues, but uh, of course there is uh, a word uh, around this, uh, this topic. So uh, uh, just to, to give an example, to give some example, is important how to recruit and motivate people to participate in, uh, in the surveys. Uh, we, uh, we can think of uh, uh, using also interviewer because interviewer uh, are not uh, strictly needed in uh, smart surveys, but uh, the, their support can help uh, at least uh, certain categories uh, of uh, population to participate in the survey. Also, it is, uh, is crucial to uh, is crucial use of incentives which can be in, in terms of uh, individual feedback or uh, monetary incentives. And then a very, uh, foc a very important uh, point are the communication strategies, because uh, uh, this type of surveys have to be, um, have to be communicated to people, to, to the population. A, a, a change of cultural approach is needed 
uh, because uh, um, is, uh, is, is necessary to exploit the uh, active role of a respondent. So there are several open issues. Uh, I, I, I wrote here just some of them, but uh, this is not uh, the real focus of this, uh, this presentation. Um, coming to the uh, methodological issues, um, machine learning algorithms are uh, a central uh, point um, in, this, uh, in this context. Uh, in fact, uh, um, machine learning algorithms are used to uh, handle and process data provided by smart devices, uh, which can be uh, uh, unstructured data or structured data, for example, images, signal, voice, um, are unstructured, and to transform this data into statistical information. For example, in the um, household budget survey, the OCR is used for reading images or receipt and classification algorithms are necessary to trace to the COICOP classification the product declared from the images. Uh, another example, we will see why these, uh, these examples are relevant. In time use, machine learning algorithm can be used to support the respondent in filling the activity diary, providing suggestions based on the use of geolocation data. In this case, GPS data can be matched with contextual information from map service and then help the respondent to provide the answer to the diary. In this context of, survey, of, of a survey, of a smart survey, uh, a crucial point uh, is the level of automation, because uh, it, maybe it's too easy to, to think that uh, everything can be automated. And, uh, in, in, but uh, on the contrary, there is uh, a, an issue about the level of automation uh, and if automation can replace the direct acquisition of information or replace manual processes without affect the quality. Uh, in fact, uh, it is also important to understand under what circumstances the results from machine learning can be used directly as statistical data and when data should be fed back to the respondent to increase accuracy. So, in fact, in general, uh, uh, paramount is the improvement of the accuracy of the performance of these uh, models uh, through um, in involving a respondent in the loop, human in the loop, through query to acquire missing, uh, missing data through labels, or involving the respondent in checking the data. And then we have the use of uh, contextual data. Coming to uh, data quality. Data quality is a big issue in smart surveys. Um, in fact, this type of survey, this type of data introduce, uh, uh, we cannot say new type of error, but uh, all types of error in a different way, uh, declined in a different way. We have uh, uh, so representation errors and measurement error. The representation error derives from uh, problems of coverage due to the unavailability of a smartphone or other devices, and no response. No response, which can be uh, motivated by unwillingness to participate, to down because it's needed to download and install an app, or to use the app actively or passively. Unwillingness to share sensor data, this is a big issue. A big issue. Uh, also due to the smartphone inability or to privacy concerns and unwillingness to provide consent to use of, of uh, sensor data. Regarding measurement errors from sensor data, uh, we, have, uh, we can have uh, incorrect starting concept, so a uh, wrong definition of the, of the process, of the construct. Uh, or we can have sensor inaccuracy, systematic or random measurement error due to sensor quality. In fact, another issue is the heterogeneity of devices, because different devices have been uh, shown in, in several studies that heterogeneity of devices has an impact, has a strong impact on the quality of the, of the data. And then we, we can have anomalies 
in the measurement, uh, outliers, noise, uh, and also the responded behavior can be an issue. So we need uh, um, all these, the, these two dimensions contribute to a total survey error framework that can be redefined in this new context. In particular, for the data quality framework, uh, we can define the, uh, in the project where we uh, have worked, that we are working, we try to define the, a data quality framework for sensor data to take into account two, two types of quality of the data. The quality of the raw data, so the, the quality of the correct, um, collected data, and the quality of the processed data. Um, and so, it's, it, in, in, uh, in order to, uh, uh, to keep this, uh, uh, the, quality of, the level of this quality in a high level, it, it is important to implement strategies to control error uh, through monitoring dashboard, the interaction with the respondent, monitor indicator, and the use of para data and contextual data, which are additional data can, that can be collected regarding the, the data collection, the uh, type of, um, of device, the app functionality, the app usage, or other variables that can influence the, uh, the use of the smartphone and the data collected by the smartphone. So, uh, coming to uh, the second part of, uh, so in the first part, uh, I gave uh, an overview of the methodological uh, challenges. Uh, in this second part of the, of the presentation, I will give uh, some information about the project in which ISTAT uh, has been, um, has been um, involved in the recent year. Um, a first project, uh, which is the um, SSNet uh, Smart Service, which uh, uh, de developed the, the, uh, its activities uh, in years 2020-2022, uh, delivered preparatory work to create uh, a European-wide methodological and architectural framework to share and reuse smart service solution and component for supporting the NSI, the European NSIs, in doing smart service. The second project, which is now uh, ongoing, is the SNET on smart survey implementation, uh, starting uh, its, its activity this year a new project aiming at implementing the defined framework for the domain of social service, mainly time use and household budget survey. So the first project, just a few words, uh, was uh, structured in two, in two, op two objectives and two work packages. Uh, uh, first obje uh, pa work package uh, uh, focusing on pilots, uh, on uh, testing uh, existing uh, tools for smart survey data collection especially for time use and household budget survey, uh, and mm, conducting so test of functionality and usability and uh, uh, testing if these tools uh, were, couldn't be, could be used in different national contexts. The second work package, which was coordinated by ISTAT, uh, afforded the, the, uh, the topic of smart survey from a very high level, uh, producing a conceptual framework for the smart service in the ESS, following a top-down design approach. The most important result of this work package, in which ISTAT was uh, involved, uh, is the description of a general framework, which, uh, uh, from different uh, perspectives, uh, methodological, technological, and architectural, providing a new and useful reference scheme for the NSI. So the second project, which is working uh, from this year, um, has the, the, the goal to implement and demonstrate the concept of a trusted smart survey, realizing a proof of concept for a complete end-to-end -end data collection process, uh, and demonstrating a solution which combines three relevant elements, involvement and engagement of citizens, acquiring, processing, and combining data collection from smart devices, and contributing to trustworthiness. This uh, project, uh, for which uh, I, I have here the, <laughs> the coordinator, the general coordinator, 
um, has, uh, is carrying out a different, uh, several different tasks that I have summarized in these four points. The definition of a methodological standard for recruitment, machine learning, human in the loop and mode effect, which represent the methodological core. The development of microservices, which are intended as component platform independent, implementing specific functions, machine learning algorithm for receipt scanning for HBS and geolocation data, use of geolocation data in time use. Um, other task is the experimentation of smart survey process to these two uh, surveys, HBS and time use. And uh, a special focus is on uh, legal and privacy issues. And ISTAT coordinates uh, this work package, work package five. Um, so ISTAT is, uh, we are involved uh, in, uh, especially uh, in the methodological task um, concerning uh, the development of standard for machine learning models within smart survey process. Uh, in particular, the, the issues uh, that we are uh, focusing uh, on are what to do when the quality of the machine learning is, the, uh, is uh, too low. So the, mm, the focus is on quality of uh, the accuracy of the prediction obtained by using machine learning uh, algorithm. So uh, when the, uh, the respondent should be asked to provide new input, how and when should the training data set uh, used in the machine learning algorithm to be updated or improved. And, and in, this, um, in this respect, uh, we, we are involved in, in uh, two case studies, one regarding HBS and one regarding uh, TUS. In particular, for time use, uh, ISTAT is working on the definition of the methodological procedure, ISTAT together with other countries, of course, uh, methodological procedures and requirement for the microservice, uh, which uh, based on uh, geolocation data, has the aim to predict uh, the activity, the activity uh, um, foreseen from uh, by the uh, classification of activity, European classification of activities. Um, moreover, this is a, a topic that we have uh, started from. Uh, Okay, thank you. Uh, moreover, uh, two pilot surveys will, are, are going to be conducted uh, in Italy from, uh, by ISTAT uh, in the context of uh, this uh, SSNet to investigate both the representation and measurement error. In fact, we have a perception survey, which is a national survey, and a pilot of time use in a smart survey context. Um, just a few words about uh, this uh, important survey, which is uh, a cross-national uh, survey on uh, perception about smart surveys. Um, the, the aim of this, uh, of this survey is uh, uh, understand what people think about this type of new survey. So do people understand the benefits of smart features? What objections do people have against mass features? Uh, to what extent are trade off between benefit and ob object to spontaneous? So many questions are uh, investigated in this survey, um, which is conducted not only in Italy, but also in the Netherlands and in Slovenia. And in Italy, it will be on field uh, in January. And uh, uh, this survey is uh, uh, conceived in a double uh, survey, a general survey which uh, ba based on uh, a sample selected by the, um, the general population uh, with a self-reported paper questionnaire. Paper because uh, we want to investigate all the population, also the population that will never participate uh, in, a, in a smart survey in order to understand uh, who they are. <laughs> So um, the questions in this paper questionnaire regards the attitude to use smart service, the experience using app, opinions on advantages and willingness to share smart data and so on. Then there is uh, the online smart survey. In the, in the paper questionnaire are embedded the, the credential to go online. And uh, in this uh, small online survey to be conducted 
preference using the smartphone. Some sensor data are shared. Uh, scanning, uh, scanning receipt, uh, scanning images of uh, met energy meters, uh, physical uh, um, step count for pedometer, and uh, or sharing location by GPS. So, uh, in the second, in uh, next spring, we will have the result of this uh, important test. The second test that is that is going to implement, uh, and uh, we are at the beginning of uh, the planning phase is a, a, a field test on time use survey in, uh, in a, um, with the idea of estimating mode effect. Uh, to, so assessing difference between data collected through smart survey and data collected with the tradi more traditional way of uh, uh, data collection. So the field test aims to compare estimate from the survey, the smart survey using uh, smart features, so the, uh, not only the web questionnaire for the diary, but also uh, the uh, location data for suggesting uh, the activities. So the idea is comparing the two, so the smart, <coughs> the smart survey with or without the geolocation data to support uh, the compilation of the activities. But we intend also to estimate uh, the mode effect with respect to the traditional uh, paper and pencil survey, uh, compa comparing uh, the data with uh, the data provided by the uh, traditional time use survey conducted uh, in uh, two um, 2023. So uh, I underline that for ISTAT is the first time, uh, ISTAT uh, so is implementing a smart survey for the first time. Uh, we will select uh, um, a sample of uh, 3,000 individuals, probably with the two-stage design, in order to use uh, also interviewer and uh, uh, to uh, foster the participation and to support respondent. And uh, we will use uh, a research platform, Motus, which uh, uh, is uh, a, a platform for conducting smart surveys. Uh, that will be used for the implementation of the question and data collection. Okay, I, just some uh, quick final remarks uh, that can be summarized, saying that uh, these smart surveys have a great potential for uh, official statistics, uh, but uh, require greater initial effort in order to define standards, to define uh, guidelines, and also to implement the, um, the architectural and technological needs. Uh, a crucial aspect uh, is data quality, and this is uh, the, uh, the topic on which uh, we are uh, in, uh, investing. And, okay. I could Thank you. Sorry, I, should I repeat the title? Uh, Fabrizio De Fauci will deliver a talk, and the title is Quantification of Urban Green Areas and Innovative Remote Sensing Approach for Official Statistics. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Fabrizio De Fossi. I work uh, in the uh, meteorological uh, department in Istat. And today I speak about uh, uh, our work about uh, quantification of uh, urban green areas as innovative, remote sensitive approach for official statistics. This work is in collaboration with uh, the um, uh, expert of domain uh, from the environmental and the territory uh, department, Stefano Mugnoli and uh, Alberto Sabbi and Giuseppe Mancioni and the uh, uh, colleagues from uh, methodological department, uh, uh, Francesco Sisti, and uh, our head of division, uh, Marco Di Zio. Uh, 
the urban green is an important aspect of our city because it's important for the wellness of the population. In Istat, we annually make an urban environmental data survey uh, for uh, uh, the principal mun munici municipalities uh, of uh, province, provincial capitals uh, to detect uh, important aspects of the uh, environmental in uh, a city as energy, mob mobili mobility, uh, waste, noise, and also the uh, uh, urban green. So, our, uh, our uh, uh, idea is to uh, uh, have an uh, automatic, produce automatic estimate of vegetation by remote sensing. Uh, sensing. Uh, as uh, uh, data sources, uh, we uh, use uh, the uh, ortho images released uh, by AGEA Agency. Uh, that um, uh, are, uh, uh, imp have an important resolution, 20 centimeters of resolution, and uh, are available uh, for all uh, uh, Italian territory um, every uh, each uh, three years from the 2012. And, uh, uh, provide for uh, bands. Uh, we use these bands and combine these bands, in particular uh, the uh, near infrared and the red uh, band uh, to produce and normalize different vegetation index. Uh, this index uh, use the different response of the chlorophyll uh, to the uh, um, electromagnetic radiation. We use this different to, uh, to build this, uh, this, um, uh, this index. Uh, the value of this uh, index uh, are uh, a range from minus one and one, uh, values close one indicates uh, uh, a vegetation, the presence of the vegetation, and negative values uh, indicates, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, the presence of water. Okay, our, uh, our um, problem is this. Uh, we have an orthophoto. We produce for each pixel of the orthophoto the NDY uh, index. And then we produce an uh, histogram of the distribution of the value of this uh, index. We can see an uh, example of this histogram. Uh, what we see, can we see, is that uh, uh, th th there are some groups in these histograms because the soil uh, uh, under the Im image uh, is different. There is water, there is uh, building, uh, and so on. And uh, um, each, uh, each cluster, each group represents uh, one type of uh, uh, this soil. We are interested to the vegetated area and uh, uh, that is the uh, right uh, cluster in this, uh, in this histogram. Uh, so we need uh, found a, a threshold. Uh, we have detected this threshold because if we know the, the value, the correct value for this threshold, we can produce uh, a mask with the, uh, with the green, with the vegetation in the map and produce statistics. But uh, uh, find this threshold is not ever simple. Uh, because uh, uh, there is uh, a variability problem. Uh, each uh, orthophoto for each uh, municipality has, has uh, different uh, uh, threshold. 
uh, or uh, for uh, other uh, orthophoto, we ha have uh, a class separation uh, uh, problem. Uh, often the, uh, these belts are overlapped. Or the number of classes uh, in, the, in the histogram are not same, the same for every histogram, but can be two, three, one, four, and so on. So uh, we, uh, we perform a preprocessing phase, in this phase uh, for each municipality. Uh, we uh, merge the uh, orthophoto uh, to uh, compose the inter uh, um, city area and, uh, and then to identify just the urban areas, we use the inhabited area type census section that are provided from ISTAT basi territoriali. We calculated the NDVI just for inhabited area and then the histogram. This is an example for Ravenna. So our uh, first approach uh, is uh, a simple approach. Uh, we are interested in, uh, uh, in the threshold that can, can be considered the, the, the last minimum, okay? How we can detect? Uh, we uh, use uh, is, um, a non-parametric uh, method, uh, kernel density estimation, KDE, uh, that we use to estimate the probability, the probability density function of a random variable, in this case the NDVI values. Uh, in the density function, uh, we detect the point uh, of maximum and minimum, and we calculated, and uh, uh, we uh, are not consider uh, the, the noise, so the small maximum and minimum point are, uh, are neglected. So the vegetation threshold is identified by the last minimum, it's simple. In the second methods, our approach is, uh, this is an uh, unidimensional cluster analysis problem, so we use uh, uh, the popular uh, algorithm to make cl cluster analysis, k-means, k-medians. And we use the result of previous uh, method, KDAE, to set um, uh, some parameters. Uh, we set the K, the number of clust uh, the, um, clusters, has uh, uh, the number of uh, maximum point uh, detected from uh, KDE, and uh, the position of this uh, maximum point to initialize the algorithm uh, k-means or uh, k-medians. K-medians is a variation of k-means, but are, uh, are, are the same, all, uh, almost the same. Uh, the last point of separation between classes is the veg vegetation threshold, okay? And this is the other approach. The third approach, advanced pipeline, we call the advanced pipeline, this approach has a slightly different purpose that of finding the specific vegetation threshold along the vegetation boundary zone, okay? Because uh, these zones are critical for our problem. So we create a vegetation mask using the vegetation threshold calculated in KDA methods, and this is the, uh, the green mask. And then we apply the mask over NDVI image and then apply edge detector filter to detect the separation zone of vegetation. So uh, in the, this line are the separation zone of vegetation. Uh, we are interested in, uh, to calculate the threshold in this, uh, in this zone. Uh, 
then we delay the age by a buffer operation and calculate a new NDVI histogram only on the buffered areas. And we, uh, you, you can see the um, orange one uh, histogram. So we apply OTSU algorithm that is a binary clustering analysis uh, algorithm uh, to detect the vegetation threshold. And this is the uh, third method. The result of uh, uh, city of Ravenna, we applied the uh, three, the four methods we have for the cluster analysis, Kemins and Kimedians, four methods. And uh, uh, in, the, in, the last, uh, in the last column, uh, we, we can see the percent of green calculated. Uh, we can see uh, that uh, the first third methods are similar results in terms of the uh, percent of vegetation between 36% and 39, 40%. Okay. Uh, the last uh, methods, uh, the advanced pipeline, redefining the identification of a more intense vegetation threshold show a lower percentage. Okay. And uh, this is the approach which the orthophoto that are uh, um, the, uh, the sources, uh, the better sources uh, that we have available. In uh, this last part, uh, I present uh, an experimentation made with a powerful tool to make uh, a threat, threat uh, the spatial, uh, uh, make special analysis uh, has Google Earth Engine. Unfortunately, with Google Earth Engine, we, uh, we can't uh, um, use the orthophoto because orthophoto are private and we, can, uh, we can't uh, use uh, this photo in a cloud. Google Earth Engine is a cloud, okay. Uh, so we make our experimentation uh, with the available uh, data, uh, available in, in um, Google Earth Engine, uh, that is satellite uh, in, uh, images from Sentinel-2. Sentinel-2 is a uh, satellite uh, that gives uh, images uh, of 10 meters of resolution is not a good resolution, has the orthophoto. I remember a remark, orthophoto has a resolution of 20 centimeters, but uh, satellite images have a good frequency of uh, image uh, for the same area. Uh, we have ever five days, uh, the, the, um, the image uh, for uh, each, uh, each area. So it's very frequent. And uh, we use this uh, information to um, uh, perform a average uh, in the uh, period of interest, because the average of images uh, reduce the noise and detect the cloud that is uh, a, and, uh, a problem in the, for the satellite image. Um, so, uh, in this platform, uh, just uh, the, the just input that we have to provide is the shape of the inhabited center of the municipality that we want to analyze. In this experimentation, uh, um, the period of interest is March 2022, July 2022 for uh, Emilia Romagna. And uh, in this um, platform, uh, the, the implementation is quick, it's simple, and uh, the execution is fast. 
So we have calculated uh, with, the, uh, with the advanced pipeline the uh, percent uh, of green uh, for uh, 30 uh, municipalities uh, in uh, um, some minutes, no, not so much. And um, we can show some results. The results are, are not so good because the resolution is, uh, is uh, 10 meters, but we have calculated uh, also for Ravenna, and the result uh, is for Ravenna uh, 30%. This is uh, aligned with the result uh, with the previous uh, uh, data sources. Uh, we can see uh, that uh, in uh, uh, case of small municipalities, uh, we have uh, um, uh, green share uh, not so good. Uh, we can see 71%, okay. But um, so this is a, a method that, uh, um, because the data sources is not a good, uh, good uh, resolution, uh, is a delicate uh, method, okay, D delicate data source. So in conclusion, uh, we uh, de determine uh, uh, of uh, the urban vegetation through radiometric approach. The uh, data sources uh, uh, are ortho images with 20 centimeters of resolution uh, that uh, um, have a, uh, a period every uh, three years. Uh, out, uh, the output uh, type um, uh, for the uh, urban center of each uh, city of interest, the provincial capitals, uh, we want to product statistic and map of urban vegetation. Our uh, study is about, uh, was about uh, an automatic identification of the vegetation threshold. We use three methods, KDE, clustering and advanced pipeline. KDE and clustering return comparable results. Advanced pipeline return lower vegetation estimate. In the next step, we uh, perform the process at across many municipalities and evaluate which uh, of the tested methods is candidate for the final estimate. Uh, we provide, uh, we want uh, 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 provide estimate after the removal of area below 100 uh, meters square. This is because uh, we are we are not interested in isolated and small uh, uh, green area. Uh, a, a more refined classification, a classified type of urban greenery, uh, sport field, park and avenue. This is uh, the next uh, step, uh, classify the, the greenery, okay? We can uh, perform this uh, with auxiliary information such as uh, uh, OpenStreetMap or uh, by machine learning approach uh, by convolution neural network, for example. And uh, we, we can try to evaluate the use of Sentinel-2 uh, for the large city uh, to have a proxy of, uh, of, uh, of the green, but uh, this is a delicate point. Uh, with, uh, estimate, uh, with a timely estimate, this is the uh, advantage to use the... Uh, the um, uh, satellite uh, data sources. Okay, thank you for vo your attention uh, and thank you for my colleagues. Okay. Thanks to Fabrizio and the third speaker today, tonight will be Maurizio Naldi from LUMSA University, and the title is Machine Learning in Official Statistics. The, is explainability an issue? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, remote control. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. 
So, uh, first, uh, a disclaimer, I'm a professor of computer science, so please don't shoot at me, and we can be friends anyway, so. And um, uh, there is a, a session tomorrow devoted to machine learning, and so I will try to uh, go through it briefly, but there are a, a number of reasons why uh, I'm talking about machine learning here, and the fact is that there is a sheer um, truth, which is the wide uh, adoption of machine learning techs, techniques in uh, every field of science. And uh, I guess this is also happening in you know, official statistics, and, and I guess tomorrow there is a survey showing it, and I, I will try to look at some areas where uh, ML can be of help. And unfortunately, uh, machine learning has a, a, a bad reputation, and this is not always deserved uh, for not being transparent. Okay, uh, that's the, there is an attitude uh, in, in some circles about seeing machine learning tools as something that a, a kind of black box. So uh, this is the result, and it is uh, in most cases utterly uh, performing because y you can get uh, accuracy, uh, you can get uh, squared errors, so high accuracies and low squared errors. Uh, as pos you can possibly have in, uh, uh, with other techniques. And so the, 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 the sheer performance of those techniques makes them, make, is a strong argument for getting them used. Uh, but in, in many cases, the, the, the attitude is that they come somewhat out of something that is not well understood and defined. And so, um, uh, this may be a problem in you know, official statistics, and uh, uh, I hope to show that actually there is a way out of it, more ways out of it. And uh, so, uh, the uh, uh, apparent uh, lack of explainability needs not be an issue here. So, uh, we have started, there is a, a question mark in the title, and uh, uh, now we have three question marks. Uh, in the roadmap, because we, we will try to um, get uh, some logical uh, steps in arriving at the final point. And so first we must ask ourselves whether machine learning can be useful for official statistics, and there is a, a, this may look like a rhetorical question. And also, if and why explainability is relevant for official statistics, and that's probably also a rhetorical question, but the third question mark is actually something we have some answers for, not all of them. And uh, we have to see how we can meet explainability requirements. We'll see some established techniques, uh, but the way is still uh, a long one uh, to be trodden. So first, this is a, uh, we start with a, a very basic, a simple question. So very basic, so much basic as to be provocative. And so what is statistics? And the concise uh, answer I like most is the science or art or counting. And there are uh, two steps in it. We have to identify what is to be counted. So when is an instance to be counted? Uh, this is straightforward in most cases. For example, let's say we have uh, to understand uh, how many people of a certain age bracket uh, have some characteristics, okay? And as long as you have access to their, um, their data, so to their, I mean, driving license or tax ID, okay, you get the answer, that's easy. But in many cases, you do not have the data available. Uh, the data may be hidden, okay? It's something you cannot observe. And uh, in that case, uh, machine learning can help because that is a typical classification task. So using some features, uh, as a proxies to identify whether that edge bracket is actually a characteristic of the distance. So uh, classification tasks are probably the most um, widely adopted uh, use of machine learning, and so uh, that's what a map can be used for the first step. The second step is uh, once we can identify whether an instance is to be counted or not, then we have to decide whether to count them all or not. And the answer in statistics is typically not. You, uh, you sample, 
uh, you sample what, whatever you, the kind of sampling you use, but you sample, you decide uh, to um, count for the instance of interest, for the feature of interest in a small sample, and then to infer the characteristic of the whole population. That's a built-in step in machine learning. Uh, we uh, do not call it uh, inference, we call it training, okay? Uh, what you call a sample is just our training data set. And we call generalizing rather than inferring, okay? So uh, the second step is something that is uh, a, a very, uh, um, say, a, a building brick of building block of machine learning. So what can uh, machine learning used for in official statistics? I started compiling a list and uh, I ended up uh, compiling, making three slides out of it. And uh, lists are boring, so I will go briefly through, through them. Uh, I guess it is uh, quite a, a comprehensive list. Of, of course, you may find uses that I, I haven't thought of. And uh, I would like to include not just the uses uh, that are uh, already common in official statistics. Uh, I mean, the ones that are carried out by national uh, statistics institutes. Um, I guess there are a number of near official statistics that are uh, generated, uh, computed by other bodies. I'm thinking of the many research centers, research groups in, uh, say, institutional bodies, which anyway uh, add to the mass of uh, near official statistics. I'm thinking of the research centers of, of um, study groups of uh, trade unions or uh, uh, industry groups and so on. <clears throat> so uh, I'm, I'm, I guess that you are familiar with all of them. <laughs> and so uh, we can have, for example, you can use machine learning for data imputation. And that's again, uh, what you call a classification, a classification task in uh, machine learning. Uh, we can use for data quality assurance, since we can uh, identify and correct errors. Again, uh, so a form of classification task. Uh, we have uh, a whole session tomorrow devoted to uh, the use in survey, uh, in service, and so I will skip for it. Um, we can use for a, a basic data classification for anomaly detection, so understanding when, when there is some unusual pattern that may uh, hide something of interest. Uh, we can use for forecasting, and that's again, uh, uh, say, uh, an important task in a, in a, in a number of um, uh, uses. We can use for sentiment analysis, so understand the perception of, of people about, uh, the opinion of people about a product, uh, a political candidate, uh, any, anything. Uh, we can use for geospatial analysis, so we have just, just seen something in the, uh, in the um, talk uh, just before mine. Uh, we can use for data linkage, so uh, trying to uh, integrate uh, data sets from different sources. And so uh, this is again a, a classification task. Uh, we can use for fraud detection, so understanding the, uh, um, uh, the amount of frauds taking place in a given contest. We can use in NLP and in data visualization. So ending up that boring list, let's see what is meant by explainability. And we have somewhat a semantic dispute here because um, in the community, uh, there are two terms that are interpretability and explainability. Uh, we may try to draw, draw a line between them, and uh, uh, there is an established view, uh, uh, but uh, uh, which, mean, which considers interpretability as the real understanding of the cause and effect within a machine learning or an artificial in, uh, intelligence system. So uh, once we get an output, what is the output due to? So we get a feature, uh, we get, sorry, a value for uh, the target variable in a regression case. We get a class for the target variable in a classification case. 
but we get that result due to the use of a number of features. And the features may be tens, uh, may be uh, thousands or even millions. If you uh, uh, process images, for example, uh, each pixel of the image is an input to a machine learning algorithm. And so if you, go, if you have a 10 million pixel image, that means that you have basically 10 million inputs to your uh, algorithm. Uh, you can somewhat use a, a, a lower resolution for that purpose and so use the so-called super pixels, so blocks of pixels. But anyway, the number of features that contribute to the result is actually uh, huge. And so you have to understand which of those features is most relevant for the output, okay? And uh, uh, um, some, somebody prefers to talk about explainability as the way to communicate those results to a wide audience. So let's imagine interpretability is something for the technically educated people, so basically the research community or the professional community, and then you have to, got to explain that result to a wide audience. Uh, this m is the case probably for offic official statistics as well, because your results are communicated to the whole population. Uh, in the field I, I'm, I've been working for, for uh, last years, uh, which is the application of machine learning in, in, uh, in the medical field, it is even more relevant, because you, uh, as a doctor, trained in understanding the results of uh, machine learning algorithms, you may understand what is, uh, what is the feature or what are the features that contribute most, most to the result, but we have to communicate it to, the, uh, to your patient. And in very simple and uh, uh, sensitive terms, okay? Um, so uh, for the time being, I will not delve into the difference between those terms and I will talk about explainability, meaning mostly that I'm looking for the way to interpret results and so to uh, understand which features are most important for the, the results. And uh, uh, the, um, the diagram that is shown here uh, is a, a widely used way of, of um, seeing the interactions and the, the relationship between those terms and uh, it may be misleading because it looks like it um, may tell you that you may have something which is explainable but not interpretable, okay? Because there is a, a part of the, the Venn diagram which is outside uh, the interpretability. Actually, it, it just means that there are tools in explainability that are beyond the range or which are uh, different from interpretable techniques, okay? So you, you must use some natural language processing and some visualiza visualization techniques to get things explainable to a wide audience. Okay, so uh, is that feature needed? And this may look like a rhetorical question. The answer is probably yes. And we need explainability for transparency needs. And that's something that is um, written in the books. In, uh, so in, uh, for example, in the quality assurance framework of the ESS by Eurostat. Um, we need explainability for accountability, for, for, for tracing the, um, uh, the reason why some decisions are taken. We need uh, explainability to be able to trace when some bias or unfairness in, is introduced in the process. Uh, we may get something that is uh, a wrong result or a biased result, and we must understand why we got the result. We need for control, quality control. We need for, to get the public trust and to get more informed use of those statistics. How can you do that in machine learning? So there is a, a wide uh, um, distinction to be made in machine learning techniques. And that is between uh, typically white box tools and black box tools. Uh, the um, say most classical uh, tools we use are tools like decision trees, support vector machines, naive based techniques, and they are intrinsically white box. That means that you can trace why 
a decision taken, why a classification output is obtained. So for example, in the tree you see on the, on the left, uh, the, the squares at the end are the leaves of the tree, and so these are the, uh, the output we, we get. Okay? So we decide whether the, 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 um, the instance we have got uh, is uh, an instance of class A or class B, but the path is driven by the features. And so we can understand, for example, if we uh, um, consider a patient to be um, affectable by uh, a disease, by a diabetes, as a consequence of some features of his age, of the results of medical tests, and so on. So in, uh, uh, this is the same in support vector machines, where we have a, a, um, a wide space of features, and we somewhat uh, have very simple linear, um, uh, say, uh, hyperplanes dividing the, uh, the classes. So these are intrinsically white box uh, tools where we are always able to understand uh, which features, which values of the features led us to a result. Um, if we want to get, uh, to get uh, uh, a measure of that, we can result to the very methods by which the tree is built. In building the trees, and so in deciding the sequence of uh, uh, features we uh, con consider, we resort to uh, either the entropy or the gene index, for example. And so we put uh, close to the root of the tree the variables that are most important, uh, which are the variables that lead to the lower, to, to high, the higher reduction of the entropy or the, the higher reduction of the gene index. So the sequence is itself a measure of importance of those features, oh, okay? Uh, but when we get to uh, uh, more uh, recent techniques, such as uh, uh, techniques based on the ensemble approach, like uh, random forests, uh, like bagging and boosting techniques, uh, or like deep neural networks, the uh, uh, close link between input and output is not so apparent. And so we have no way uh, no easy way to trace uh, the way from the path from the input to the output. So we have no easy way to understand which features are really important. And so we must uh, somewhat uh, rely on some new metrics. Um, uh, interpretability uh, typically comes at the expense of uh, accuracy, and that's why uh, we uh, see that um, more, the most accurate techniques, typically deep learning, are not so accurate. So we can, uh, we have a trade-off between having, a, um, say, a, a white box interpretability, and so we have decision trees, for example, on one side of the spectrum, or to have higher accuracy, which typically involves a lower interpretability. And uh, which methods can we use to achieve interpretability? Uh, we have so far, so far a, a range of methods, and I will focus uh, for the time being on two ones, which are the most widely used, uh, even in uh, uh, the application of um, explainability techniques or machine learning techniques in, uh, in official statistics, which are SHEP and LIME. Uh, SHEP stands for Shapley Additive uh, Explanations and line for Local Interpretable Model Agnostic Explanations. Um, they both lie in the same class of techniques. They are post hoc, that means that they reply to some uh, algorithm that you have already uh, completed. So you first build the model and then explain it. They are local, so they explain predictions for a single instance or for a limited uh, region of the space of instances. So they are not capable of uh, providing an explanation for the whole uh, space of features. And they are model agnostic, which is good. Uh, so the means that are, and <coughs> they are largely applicable. Okay, I've gone too far. And so uh, both rely on a surrogate model. So uh, I will not go into detail here. So, Basically, that means that what we use 
just a bunch of instances close to the uh, instance of interest to draw a linear model. And so the linear, the dashed line you see here, there is just the uh, line marking the, 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 um, the separation between class A and class B instances, okay? Roughly the same is uh, done for SHAP, for the SHAP approach. And uh, here instead you rely on a, a model where there is a linear, um, uh, a linear combination of features and you rely on the on, uh, uh, game uh, approach uh, to, uh, uh, say, to um, extrapolate the, um, the importance of a single feature. So just uh, uh, to come to the conclusion, sorry for uh, being out of time. And uh, uh, the, the trend is now for local explanation rather than global ones. And uh, uh, challenges ahead are just uh, looking for not just single features, so not extracting the most relevant or the couple of features that are most relevant, but the combinations of features so that we can take account of their interactions. Uh, we are looking so also for uh, methods that are um, applicable across different domains. And we also uh, uh, work, are working about uh, um, the way of establishing some performance metrics for the explanation capability. Okay, uh, concluding, happily enough, this is not a task for our community alone, because there are a number of uh, communities working on it. So, thank you. Sorry, sorry about that. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we, we, we started late. We are even more, even later now. So, <laughs> but I hope that Professor Lee Chung will be able to speed up, speed up and, and, and close it in time. Well, people might uh, complain that I speak even faster than normally. Uh, so we have, uh, we have three, I think, very interesting talk, uh, uh, ranging from something very tangible to the, uh, the spatial sort of classification algorithm I'm sure not all of you would have be familiar with, and uh, then move on to the final talk, which is, I would say, touching on a little bit more philosophical dimension. Um, so my, my discussion will try to take you through it through a path which I see it uh, may be connecting the t three ones. Let's start with this one, smart surveys, more troubles. Okay, I think you agree. So therefore, I, I, I congratulate the uh, authors for taking on these challenges through the 2S network and outlining the sort of the pilot, especially the pilot surveys that's actually going to uh, do something and get to the sort of problem. Uh, um, the way I see it, there is a trend-wise, there is a growing diversification of what you might call survey mode with the addition of smart survey, right? Uh, in the beginning, we have face-to-face -face interview. That's not smart. Uh, then we move on to something more stationary, uh, but without the personal uh, sort of presence. So it could be paper, could be phone, telephone, uh, could be internet, uh, then you get onto the PC and so on. This is also not considered smart by the definition what it is, it, since it has to be used a mobile uh, device. Uh, but uh, don't worry, there might be renaissance for these mode too. Huh? I wouldn't be surprised if someone is already working on it or maybe even writing paper. How do you suppose? You know, telephone, telephone service is called the computer assisted uh, telephone interview, right? What if it's chat GPT assisted telephone interview? Huh? Someone probably is writing paper on it. So don't, don't count on these things are not smart. But, okay, smart, smartphones, that's smart, okay, in that sense, that's fine. Um, so mobile phone, tablet, these are supposed to be smart, and the paper said very clearly, sort of online questionnaire to push the form from the paper to a small screen, that's not really very smart. Uh, but what we really hope to capitalize on is those apps and those sensors huh, can follow you continuously without you sitting there and trying to put in input. Okay, so I think it's, it's, the paper was not very clear to distinguish, but I would like to make it very clear. 
there are two kinds of approach. You could use the NSI apps and sensors. Okay, we can give you an app. We can ask you to take pictures, how to send the data, and so on and so forth. So we create this channel for you, right? We can even operate a chip under you if you, if you would like. We can do that. But that's the NSI is, is doing this. Or you're relying on third party, existing services. This is a very important distinction, I think, okay? Smart survey, how smart? How far do we want to go? And within every smart sort of this type of app sensors, I would also like to distinguish between what I call active and passive mode, which I think the paper is touching on, right? And I give you an example. So for example, if you, take, if you say I, I, I take a picture of the receipt, you are a little bit active, right? You're being a little bit active. But if you just say I give you permission to look for my phone, there is an app installed that you can iCloud synchronize automatically my geolocation on my phone. If I give you permission to do that, that's passive. You see the difference? Okay, so the question is, the active precipitation, why do you want to do a smart survey? Well, because people don't answer. Why people don't answer? Because people don't want to be bothered. Why people don't, it's too troublesome. So you don't want to trouble people, right? So you ask people to take a picture. Okay, in Stats Norway, what we do, we ask people to collect the receipt from the shop. Don't do anything, you collect the receipt from the shop. At the end of the week, put the shop in an envelope, which we send to you, and send it back to us. What more do you need to do? You don't need to take picture of everything. So how much trouble are you asking people by this active participation, despite that you, have, you may be very happy using a phone, I don't know, but, so this is a question I think needs some kind of pilot should pay attention. I'm sure you're aware of this, so I'm just, for people not thinking about this problem. So that's one question I think is important. So is this smart survey really reducing the burden? Is it really? But on the other hand, you will say, we have to give people options. Otherwise, it will just go down. We have to, if you want to do it this way, let's do it. If you want to do it this way, that's the kind of idea, I think. We make a trouble, take on troubles because people would like to be different, right? The other side of the story, which the activity, uh, I think is this, uh, if I might say it, are we moving from informed consent of participation, which is traditional survey, to informed consent of sharing? Okay, basically you would like to use data, you would like to use my data, I give you permission. Now go to Google and get my data, I don't care. I'm happy for you to do that. Are you able to? That is why it's important whether it's a third party app or your NSI's app, because if it's an NIS app, NIS device, you give consent, I already have everything. But the third party, you give me consent, the trouble is only beginning. <laughs> you see my point? Okay, selection issue, think about it, who would be joining that? But you use mixed mode, so therefore, come on, more people, so leads on to the mode problem. So there was a divergation of mixed mode, you will keep mixed mode, you will not, you will not go to only doing smart. Right? It will be mixed mode. So the mode thing will come back. Legality, are you able to? I give you permission to get data from Google. Are you able to? I would like to see. <laughs> okay. Ability, now you get the data from Google. Google says, I'm not doing anything for you. This is the data dump on you. Are you able to handle it? Oh, we have to spend time on it. It's not that easy. Okay, suppose you spend time and learned how to deal with it. I'm giving you so much data. Are you able to handle it? Is your server going to run down? Are you going to, are you going to have the same data storage park as Google or all these high-tech companies? Is the MSI able to go that way? Capacity between the ability and capacity. All these issues, if you really want to think, or is it really just we want to do the best we can? But really the long-run long -term picture, what is the survey going? We, we, well, it's, it's difficult. But we want to sort of do the smart survey, at least maybe you can relieve some situations, okay? That's, that's, that's more like we try to cope. It's not a, like a strategy of sustainable winning strategy for the next hundred years or something like that. That's my feeling, okay? Unless you can really go to achieve this informed sharing state. If you are really able to do that, then I think, yes, burden is gone, okay? Then it's just a question of sharing. Yes, there will be selectivity, but let's deal with that problem, okay? That's my, that's my point. Okay. The mode effect. Here, in particular, one type of mode effect which is different from the previous mode effect. When, the smart, when you do not have smart survey, the mode effect also exists. So you have mode effect between face-to-face, -face, between paper, between sort of internet. We're now getting a new type of mode effect. 
uh, which is what I call machine learning transformed instead of respondent digested. You see my point? If you're answering on the phone, it's different than face-to-face. -face. It's still respondent digested response you get. I prefer to say this way, I decide to answer like that. But here we are talking about sensors, pictures. You have to learn it. I'm giving you the signals. You have to tell me what I'm doing here. Am I here just to meet a friend? Or am I being here today attending a workshop? You have to learn it. It's not read it, digest it anymore. Okay? That is a new type of mode effect, which you have to think about it. If we really move towards that sensor-based, it's not, it's not just, okay? Now, this leads nicely to the next talk, which is machine learning transfer digest for you, okay? Now, this is getting a little bit more technical. So let's put on some, some, some pictures. So this picture, this is Stripe. On the left-hand side, this is like the picture that you have, okay? Everybody can give an opinion how green it is. Okay, great. Then the middle ones is one type of method will give you transformed like this. That is my greenness kind of uh, uh, classification. And then to the upper right, that's another algorithm that will give you something different, okay? So now the question is, which one is right? How good is your classification? You come to this question. What is, what is the uncertainty now? Now, everybody looking at the left-hand side, they say, yeah, can, you can argue. If we really sort of disagree, let's go to the park and see, okay? If we really see the picture is not clear enough, let's go to the park and have a look. So I imagine in order to tune your algorithm, somehow you have to do some kind of a supervised stuff, right? Supervised learning. That's what I do. Now, I'm not going to talk about how you can do this learning better. You can easily imagine doing this learning better in many other ways, okay? Think about it. The algorithm says, I do something, I find a threshold, I cut off, above it, it's one, below it, it's zero, right? How do we otherwise do classification in statistics or make a decision? Binary decision, how do we do it? Testing. What is the best test? It's a likelihood ratio test, right? Classification, entropy. The difference between P to Q, the two distribution. So what we normally do more interested is the contracts, not the absolute. So is it the only way to deal with this problem? I'm not sure, okay? And why classification as a framework is not necessarily the good one. We just talked about these, uh, these uh, they, uh, I give you the uh, uh, Brexit. I give you Brexit, right? What Brexit? The, the parliament, uh, sort of election before Brexit, UKIP got 16% vote. 16% of vote. But did not get a single seat in the parliament. And why? Classification. Because in every district, it's out, 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 out. You see my point? This is why classification is not necessary, intrinsically is, 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 not, a, is not an unbiased approach. If you want, if you want to estimate the green area proportion, 30% or not, by classification, every pixel is actually not, it intrinsically it's not an unbiased approach. It's just how biased you are. That's the question, okay? If you really want to be unbiased, you want to turn this measure or whatever into a probability and then just add up those probabilities. That is your unbiased approach, okay? That, so I'm sure you can do many other things. But I, that's not my beef with, 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 with approach. I mean, people doing the best you can, and, and of course, maybe there are ways of doing better in, in future. That's what it is, no problem. What I want to say is, what about the uncertainty? What have I did? Even my probability, I turned it into a probability. Is it, how good is it? Under my model, I, I give you the unbiased, but how good is it? I still have this question, right? I still have this question. I want to talk about this question. How good it is? I'm telling you, think about the only thing we really know about the sort of the validity is statistical validity only comes from based on something you know, not based on something you bet on or you guess on. That's the only way. The only way to know it is sampling. So distribution you know, that's it. Experimental design, whatever. It's because you're relying your inference on something you know, therefore you are sure. If you only rely on something on you bet on, you can never be sure. That's it. So, using probability sampling to combine, to accommodate the machine learning algorithm, that is the way to go, okay? So, I gave you two papers. One paper is to talk about, give me any algorithm. 
So this algorithm, S2 algorithm, if those picture images were sampled by probabilities, think about it, those pixels can be sampled by two-stage sampling or cluster sampling or whatever, right? But all these images sampled probability, then on every image, I, my, my algorithm and the truth will have the error. This will allow me to propagate an unbiased estimate, model system. We have a method of doing that, okay? You can do model unbiased estimation given any algorithm. It doesn't matter left algorithm or right algorithm. I will give you unbiased. The only difference is efficiency. One is more efficient than the other. That's it. But both will be unbiased. And it's unbiased over repeated sampling. Okay? And then you can move that further to say, actually, instead of correcting an estimator directly, I'm going to consider a prediction estimator of this form, right? I just train them one. Everything I don't see, I'm going to use that one. Everything I see is that what I see. Now, that one is not, doesn't have to be using probability, using the sampling to drive this prediction at all. It's completely model-based. So now the question is, what is the error of this model-based thing? And this can be assessed over repeated sampling. Again, as long as those training material is coming from sampling, I'm already going to give you the design-based bias, mean square, and all these things, okay? even at the individual level. So this is the thing I think going forward in terms of this, this we have to pay attention to it. I mean, we have to learn the uh, techniques for doing advanced models and algorithms. Okay, fine. But at the same time, how do we deal with, with uncertainty? Be very clear. The only thing you can be sure is if you base on something you know. What we know, sampling design, that's it. So you have to move that way. To combine, absorb your, absorb your machine learning, all these techniques within the sampling framework. That's the way we go for. Whether it's for estimation or it's for quality evaluation and so on and so forth. That we will maintain this one. We can, you can throw any algorithm in future, we will be in this position, basically. We don't need to move because I am the god. I, am, I create this simple random sampling, basically, right? You see my point? Okay. Finally, moving on to the explanatory. Sorry about the, sorry about the. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, but, but the last talk is so interesting. I mean, you, can't, you cannot deny me the, the chance to talk. Explanatory, I, I really like this because the explanatory interpretability, I mean, I'm, I'm sure if we had more time, we could discuss it uh, uh, moreover. What I would like to draw attention to, I'm not saying this is, uh, every point is, 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 uh, is relevant. Um, so the, what is to be explained? That is the question I want to discuss, okay? The so-called lime, here I'm going to give you an example of lime, okay? So given the S2 algorithm, they have classified this picture like this. That's the previous, you've, you've seen that, right? That previous thing, that's the atom right. I'm just using the same thing. This part, that's how it's classified. So there is a question, how does, how does it do it? What is it doing, right? How, how does it come to this? That, that's a kind of the explanation, the how, or what is it doing? So one way of talking about is a local interpretable model agnostic explanation. What is it? Here I'm giving you the green. The green line is my low line for this point. That is what it is. It is a white box model to explain exactly how the algorithm behaves in that situation. That algorithm, the boundary is behaving like a linear tangent like this, okay? The locally, the point is like this, okay? If you move a little bit, it's, you can just move along. If you move further, no, move to another point. That's a local explanation. That's exactly what the Lime is doing for you. Are you happy now? Do you feel explained? Yeah, maybe, some, some, some may not, right? But what I'm saying is that that's not the issue. I don't want to explain the model. That's my point. Why? I don't want to explain the model because we heard this morning, all models are wrong. <laughs> Only some are useful, okay? If you take this philosophical position, all models are wrong. When you model, you bet against God, therefore don't be too sure, okay? So all models are wrong. If all models are wrong, how do you defend? The more you explain, the worse it looks like. You see my point? So I don't want to explain it's interesting to explain. People will be happy, fine. But I don't think that's the end of the story. What we need to explain is not the model, is how we use the model. Right? Understand? People say, well, the gun don't kill pe people, people kill people. Right? You see my point? How do you use the instrument? Model is just an instrument. Model is just an instrument, right? How do you use the model? The only way we can define it is how we use the model. Then maybe say, yeah, the way you use the model, I think it's acceptable, even though I know your model is not perfect. You see my point? You cannot defend the model by saying, 
try to explain to people this model. You, you have to accept my model. Come on, come on. Yeah. So once you can do it, next time you can't do it. That's it. Because you bet against God. You can never win, right? Okay. So that's why it's important this kind of, again, coming back to this uh, uh, basing inference on something known, this sampling problem. This, this is a contribution to science, okay? The sampling idea, how we can approach descriptive inference from such a point of view. It's a contribution. Don't forget about it. Don't be blended by all these other things. At the end of the day, how do you make things? And I think if I'm able to give you, like I said, an estimated mean square of green area total in Rome by the given S2 algorithm and the mean square error is unbiased over repeated sampling of my training pixels. I think I've already explained how I use it. Thank you. Thanks, Li Chun. I, I would leave just one minute for the, the, for the speaker, okay. for, for the joiner, if they want. Or is there any other very quick, quick question? No question. No question. <laughs> OK. So just one minute for. Oh, there is a question. Okay. Stefano. <laughs> Maybe <clears throat> just a couple of comments. So I agree totally with the discussion you made, uh, Professor Zhang, and I think it answered my, my point I mean, or your question to me. Why we need statisticians doing also machine learning, working with machine learning community mm -hmm. and this type of unstructured data? Exactly because of the reason you just mentioned. And, and the other comment is about um, explainability or interpretability that Analdi use kind of in interchangeably. Actually, you are just explaining um, not what causes the answer to your model, uh, just which parameter or feature actually explain the output of the model. There is no causation, it's mostly correlation. So what is missing in the machine learning literature, but there are now a stream of work on this, it's about building causal model out of uh, machine learning, say, algorithms. And that's why you need to understand the model. So you need to explain the model because you want to understand the, what's the, so the mechanism behind the input and the output. Not, how, not just how good is my deep neural network to approximate a function in some kind of algebraic space, which is what machine learning does. So that's just a comment. Just one quick reply. Yes, it's not a reply. It's, uh, thank you for your uh, interesting and stimulating remarks. Uh, a bit provocatory, but I think very useful for the discussion. Also with the, the uh, um, Eurostat, which uh, uh, fund indeed this uh, project and uh, announced this type of uh, research. Thank you. And thank you for my co-authors that I forgot. To, to mention the Monica Perez, Francesca Inglese, and Fabrizio De Fausti. Sorry for that. It's the same thing. Okay. First, uh, so, yes, uh, all models are wrong. We're not trying to explain models, but some are, are useful, and we're trying to explain the most useful models. That's it. And we are not talking about uh, causation. I mean, there is no uh, intent uh, on that purpose. So, we're just trying to understand what drives the output with that algorithm. So what contributes most to the decision taken by the algorithm? But may, whether it's just an image, a representation of reality, may uh, be a, a mystification of reality, but just, it's just the way the algorithm works. Okay? And that's not easy when you have complex uh, tools like deep learning networks. Yes, uh, thank you, Li Chung, for the, uh, uh, the consideration. Uh, for uh, uh, the, uh, we need, of course, uh, uh, of a benchmark uh, in, this, uh, in this approach, but uh, uh, we, uh, we haven't a benchmark because uh, uh, for the orthophoto, there is a timely time uh, matching with the ground truth in the, so, is not uh, possible uh, for uh, uh, synchronism of time, okay? 
and uh, a, a sample for uh, uh, give some uh, uh, estimation of the error uh, is, uh, uh, is expensive, okay? So we have not uh, a benchmark for this problem. And uh, the other, uh, other point interesting for us is, uh, um, okay, classification is not, uh, uh, is not uh, uh, the, um, a good, uh, uh, the best uh, uh, task, okay? Uh, we uh, apply also gaussian mister model that uh, return uh, a probability of, uh, of this, but uh, uh, we have not presented the result because uh, uh, we um, uh, had some problem with the convergence and with the number of components of uh, uh, the Gaussian mixture. So we have not presented that the results. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, and the ex explainability is also an interesting uh, point. Thank you. See you tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Yes.